so this is true. Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to direct interference, uh, targeting individual, politi individual politicians or political parties, um, we will have to maybe observe it a little more uh, and a long, uh, over a longer time, but I, don't, I do not see so much of that, at least not uh, something which is really um, influencing the course of things in this campaign. Um, so all what we're seeing are shortcomings, failures, uh, topics coming out of uh, traditional media outlets, uh, debated not only on, on Twitter in, in certain bubbles, but all over the place um, in, in the German uh, public uh, sphere. And that's why uh, my bottom line still is that in, in many aspects, it's, it's still a very traditional campaign. Okay. Um, before I get to audience questions, I'd love for you, Constanza, to sort of weigh in on what Neil said, and also Gunter, sitting where you are in the Interior Ministry. I mean, I, I'm assuming that this is something that's being watched very closely, considering that there also have been a number of hacks in Germany against political figures, as well as in against the Bundestag as an institution. Um, are we making a mountain out of a molehill? Um, Constanza, why don't you start and then we'll go to Gunter. Look, I, I don't think we are. I mean, I think the, 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 the increase of hacking is really significant. And, um, you know, govern, naturally, neither government agencies nor companies like to talk about their vulnerabilities, right? Um, but that is a significant vulnerability of our digital infrastructure that we really need to do something about um, and that we haven't taken seriously enough. That said, um, the, you know, the, ultimate, the ultimate goal of hacking is people's heads. And the vulnerability of, of people for, for you know, disinformation is what really is is I think what really needs to be addressed, and that that's that's a matter for you know public education. It's also a matter for politicians, you know, deciding how to shape public discourse. I mean, it seems to me, frankly, that this I, I agree with Niels that that much of this this political campaign seems rather old fashioned. It also, frankly, seems to me, seeing it from afar, to focus on on um, you know, some rid ridiculously minor points in many ways and not, and not on the big topics affecting all of us. And I find that disturbing. That said, I don't know how, I, I'd love to hear how other, other people think about this, but it seems to me that the flood of trawling and uh, overt misinformation that we saw around, you know, that first arrived on German social media around the time of the annexation of Crimea and the Ukraine crisis really has receded. It's become a lot more subtle and a lot more organized. And, and that's, I think, a phenomenon in itself that's worth noting. But the, what, I, what I now interestingly get under my financial crimes column is much more Chinese syntax than, than Russian syntax. In the in the comment section, <laughs> we'll we'll definitely have a chance to, like I said, parse through um, the dashboard findings after this panel. But Gunter, before I turn to audience uh, questions, I'd like to ask you. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that your the um, Interior Ministry is taking um, this topic very seriously. Um, do you think that Germany? I mean, I, I'm, I, I, we believe in the efficiency of the German system and the sanctity of the election here, but do you think that um, that this is not debated enough about how Germany can be a target of disinformation or information manipulation? And are you seeing any threats to campaigns or parties this year? So of course we take it seriously. It's our duty in our ministry, but generally also I think in German, German government, also in German parliament. And uh, even though we don't see major attacks yet, just the election is, is a very important thing that is at stake here. And if the election is threatened and the integrity of it, our democracy is at stake. So we have to have a really low level of, of awareness here to really also 
make this known to the public that the possibility is there. Please, as an as a, as a, as a, as a proposition, um, use um, um, all your media information critically um, and, and don't take anything uh, automatically for granted. And um, I think it's also clear that uh, what Neil Schmidt said, that there are more people that are generally in opposition to a political system. I think this number seems to be growing at least, um, grow at least more and more people are making all of this public of also, also the, the new chances and new possibilities of social media formerly maybe these people thought uh, they were which they uh, are in a, in a minority but now it seems to them they're on, almost in the majority because they find so many forums in social media on the internet where like-minded people um, have the same general opposition and uh, it's in my eyes not about conspiracy theories conspiracy myth there's no real theory behind it and of course, it has been, again, uh, um, growing during the, the pandemic. People have maybe more time to think about these things or to, to think out a certain crazy, uh, crazy myth. And where some people were really uh, upset about uh, some things that had to be done in, in time of a crisis. And of course, social media kind of um, contributes to a, a possibility to, um, to exchange and to share uh, such information. And that's a diff certainly different way of communication, which is not there for the first time in this election. We had social media last uh, time, even time before, but it's certainly it's growing. And um, there, I think we have a phenomenon that's not so surprising, that uh, fake news is sometimes, or most of the time, more interesting because it's so crazy sometimes. So people find it more interesting. I don't even assume that everybody that shares fake news personally believes uh, in them. But then other people who get this information through this person, even then again, maybe only the, every second person believes it, but it's of course enough to spread it around. And it's always uh, the same thing, even before social media, as Mark Twain uh, once said, um, a lie has traveled around the world um, and, uh, until or even faster than uh, the truth has uh, fastened its shoelaces. So it's really lies traveling faster, uh, being spread um, uh, more around. To a certain degree, you have to live with it. But if we can detect that it's steered, that there is some plan behind it from a group inside of Germany or also from state actors, um, you mentioned Russia, for example, or half state actors or in the shady twilight between state actors and non-actors, then of course we have to make it public. The Ministry of Interior is certainly not a truth ministry. It's not our, uh, not our duty and not even we shouldn't do it to um, test every news that's out there, whether it's uh, correct or incorrect. But we should, in our also, as you mentioned, of, of a domestic um, intelligence service, for example, they should and they, they will do, um, put a spotlight on certain uh, connections. So if, for example, an, a, a real person is influencer or a bot is influencer gets much prominence on, on certain fake news uh, messages, uh, if we can, of course, prove and can show that this person was financed by some person out of Germany or inside of Germany, from Russia or elsewhere, we want to make this open and known to the public that everybody can judge for him or herself. And I think that's very important to get the public informed. And of course, we count on the public, at least on many people that are interested in this information and we want to provide it. That's um, um, not that we say a thumbs up or thumbs down to something, but we want to uh, get people informed. Okay, I have a string of questions that have come in. I'm going to try to group these. Um, I guess the first one is related to Nord Stream 2. I mean, Niels, why don't we talk a little bit? You were saying that the election has been sort of quote unquote traditional thus far. Um, has foreign policy played a role at all um, in the election campaign? I mean, it seems like a lot of the topics that are um, fodder for disinformation regarding the coronavirus pandemic um, have been prominent, but how about certain foreign policy issues that are obviously um, linked to certain countries like Nord Stream 2? Um, has have that played a role thus far? Not really. As in many campaigns, foreign policy does not play a major role in this campaign. Um, there is no war going on or no war being prepared like in uh, 2022 uh, 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 um, 2002, uh, when uh, Schröder campaigned against Germans, uh, German participation in the Iraq war. And even Afghanistan has become 
although it has become an issue, it, it's it's not really uh, prone to to um, uh, to political bickering and uh, to uh, to benefiting to one or the other party, I, I guess. So now it's more about domestic policy and it's about the chancellor because after 16 years of uh, Ms. Merkel's uh, tenure, uh, more and more people want to know who will be the next chancellor, who is the right man or woman uh, to do the job. Uh, that has always been part of a federal campaign in Germany, but this time, this is especially interesting. Um, and now at the end of the holiday season, more and more people are waking up and saying, oh, uh, Miss Merkel will not be there any longer. So now let's look at those guys who want to uh, succeed uh, to her. Um, OK, um, but foreign policy does not really play uh, a role in this campaign. But what is also visible and what can be seen and felt in this campaign is a long, long uh, standing effort by Russia to, um, uh, to forge an image of Russia and of issues related to Russia, which are uh, very uh, peculiar, so to say. Um, uh, but this uh, has been an effort which has been underway for many years. Uh, Constanze rightly mentioned uh, the Crimea annex annexation. And from this time onward, we've seen lots of these uh, efforts uh, being uh, at, at dis on display. Um, uh, but foreign policy, as in many uh, cases, is not uh, really an issue in this campaign. Um, Constanza, one of our um, audience members is asking about whether women in positions of leadership are perhaps um, more prone for vicious attacks, um, like as you know, we saw similarities in the 2016 election. I mean, obviously, um, Annalena Baerbock has made mistakes on the campaign trail, but we've also found that she has um, received a disproportionate amount of attention on social media. What role do you think um, do you think uh, gender mis uh, disinformation is being uh, is is it ha does it have a role in the German election? Do you think this is also um, a reason, perhaps, why the Greens are trailing at the moment? Well, I mean, as you say, Suda, um, she did make some mistakes. I I personally think they're minor. But, you know, when you want to become chancellor, you don't get to make minor mistakes. You know, that's the problem. I, I think what this did show, I, I have tr real respect for her intelligence, her energy, and, and many of her positions. Um, but I, I sort of wish that she'd had, you know, at least five, five years in some executive position. And I think that would have made her more ready for prime, for prime time. The, and I and I hope that she will get that chance in much the same way that um, Anna Gret Pam Karrenbauer, after a problematic run as you know defense minister and party head, in my view, got a chance to shine to shine um, as defense minister, and and I think has a lot of friends among her allied peers. That's really quite impressive. Um, I think she has actually. I do think that she has a future ahead of her, and I hope that that's true for Baerbock as well. But but do women get sort of special attention from the trolls? Um, and based on my personal experience, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, very clearly. But again, I mean, I'm I'm not sure, not so sure that this is the Russians or the Chinese. As excuse me, German men. <laughs> and, and no insult to Gunther or Niels, but there is clearly still something. That 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 makes men feel threatened about women in high political office, despite 16 years of Merkel as as chancellor, and and I find that you know saddening. And we're we're not the only culture where that's the case. I do think, though, uh, having spent you know a lot of time confronting this kind of stuff, that we in Germany still have some catching up to do compared to other cultures where women have just been. Uh, you know, normal members of the workforce and, and of the political workforce for, uh, you know, earlier than us. I'll say that. Um, and then here's another question that I think I can sort of pose to all three of you. Um, it's pretty general, but it actually is quite interesting. What are the vulnerabilities of the current German debate 
on domestic politics that could be manipulated by foreign actors. I mean, we've talked about the vaccines and coronavirus, but are there other topics that you think, Gunter, that say the, you know, the interior ministry is keeping an eye on that could be um, weaponized um, in terms of disinformation, like i.e. migration? Are there other topics right now that are perhaps open to being um, weaponized? So everything around the coronavirus uh, and our measures are certainly um, open to for such attacks. Um, there are all kinds of rumors going on, uh, duties to be vaccinate, vaccinated, or um, about the, the um, how this is spread, what what the government um, agenda the, that there is a government agenda behind it, and all all things like this. I think are very to this community a very thankful uh, uh, topic. But of course, migration is another topic uh, about refugees. We had this years ago, of course, when the major refugee crisis was there, uh, the allegation that we would uh, every night in, 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 the, in the small wee hours uh, would, would have um, um, uh, plane loads of people we get in from some place in Asia or so to uh, make them immigrate and come to Germany. Um, it could well be possible that this might also be um, uh, now set around uh, the crisis in Afghanistan. So these are certainly topics, also the whole security uh, issues um, where fake news um, is used um, and also shared. Uh, and that's certainly one of the pro some of the topics that our agencies keep an eye on, but it's, it's, it's uh, theoretically um, without limits. Um, you could in every resort, in every um, portfolio of the German government, Take this could uh, can can spread around, and we again like at least to detect it, and like to show to the public um, maybe what interest is behind such fake news. If, if, if it's a organized um, uh, uh, procedure, I think that's what we can and should do. Um, Niels, add one more question, actually one of my own, and then I would like to end with uh, Constanza, something that she mentioned at the beginning of our um, discussion. Uh, Niels, uh, when you uh, talk to your constituents, um, I mean, do they get most of their information from sort of the traditional behemoths of ARD and CDF, the public broadcasters? Do you find that, um, that the, sort of the traditional sources um, here in Germany are still have the credibility that they perhaps had maybe 20 years ago? Uh, well, this has uh, certainly changed over time. Uh, there's still a high level of credibility for uh, public uh, TV, uh, but what I see among my constituents is a more diversified um, media um, perception. So the Twitter, social media, play a more important role. And I'm confronted with uh, topics and issues coming out of that. And this has uh, definitely uh, changed over time. Um, in, in so far, we are not so different from other countries. Uh, but still, uh, when it comes to vulnerabilities, I think our economic system is much more vulnerable than our political system when it comes to direct interference or hacking. Um, and uh, we mentioned the Chinese playing a, a bigger role in that game. And this is all about um, industrial espionage. It's not so much about uh, political interference so far. Uh, and so uh, I think um, we have, as politicians, we have to deal with this very much more diversified um, media coverage and um, and uh, you cannot rely on people all watching, for example, a TV debate. There are many people who just didn't watch it. And so uh, there is not this self-evident common basis of uh, political information we used to have 20 years ago. Um, uh, and this is like uh, in the entertainment field. So 20 years ago or 30 years ago, everybody watched the uh, first channel Tatort, so the crime series, uh, the German crime series. And Monday morning, you could talk about to anybody about the latest Tatort uh, movie, but now this is over. And even when it comes to the German soccer team, okay, many people still watch the game, <laughs> but uh, still even that has uh, also um, uh, dwindled. So. 
yeah, that's how our society has evolved. Uh, and when it comes to media coverage and uh, media use, this has really changed a lot. And I cannot keep a tra a track of all that uh, in my direct encounters with my constituents, uh, I must admit, yeah. Constanza, last question to you. I wanna go back to something you said about, you know, sort of Germany being um, kind of the core for in terms of unity for Europe. Um, so, you know, just tell me again, why do you think Germany is a ripe target or a, or a um, attractive target for foreign interference or, um, information ops. I, I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but you could just well, give a quick summation. It would be great. Sure. Um, it's fairly simple. With Brexit, there are now two sort of major anchor political economies of Europe, France and Germany. And I, I think what, um, and, and you know how willing I am to, to criticize German domestic or foreign policy, but I think what does distinguish us at least opposed to the, uh, as opposed to the current French government and perhaps French governments in general, is our commitment to European cohesion. Again, I'm not saying that we don't do things that undermine that, Nord Stream 2 is, a, is, a, is an example in point, but the commitment to building bridges between North and South, East and West, between the large and the small, has been a hallmark of German governments. Undermine that undermine that willingness, make Germans fearful, make Germans inward looking, and you have a recipe for, for European consensus falling apart. That's it. With that, I think we're, we can say thank you to all three of you. And uh, Niels, I will be watching the German national team play tonight. I hope uh, everything goes well for Hansi Flick. And, uh, thank Sorry, you. is this about basketball? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank all three of you and I hope all of you stay tuned for our dashboard uh, presentation. Thank you, Niels, uh, Constanza and Gunter and wish all of you a good afternoon and the rest of your morning. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you for having me on. Bye-bye. Good to see you all, stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Suda, and I hope you enjoyed this introduction into the questions. As Suda and Laura have already mentioned, uh, we, will, we have an exciting tool that ASD has developed with our partners uh, that will allow us to look at some of these questions more in depth. So right now, I am presenting my colleague, Senior Fellow Brett Schaefer at the Alliance for Securing Democracy to present our German elections dashboard and go through some of the major trends we have seen. Brett, over to you. Thanks, Christine. I'm gonna share my screen here quickly so people can actually see the dashboard. So when you land on the dashboard, uh, you'll see we have several partners on this project, most notably the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, but also Politico, and quite soon we'll be adding data from who targets me. So the purpose of the dashboard was to provide basically a summary analysis of the topics and themes being promoted by the four major state actors that we thought would be involved perhaps in this election, that's China, Iran, Russia, and Turkey. But obviously we wanted to provide that data within the context of what the German media as well as the German political scene is discussing. So we have accounts from across all of the major political actors and the major German media outlets that allows us to compare and contrast messaging. So if you scroll through, you see sort of the top lines, the key phrases, the hashtags being used on Twitter, as well as the countries being mentioned, the people being mentioned. One of the interesting findings is obviously Germany is the most discussed country. Number two, despite the fact that we're looking at state media from Russia, Turkey, China, and Iran, is the United States. So the United States is, is just a clear topic uh, of conversation across the board. And then, as I mentioned, we do have some polling data that we bring in from Politico, which allows you to look at 
certain messaging and when that has coincided with a dip or a rise in the uh, fortunes of a certain political party. So on the dashboard, it defaults to English, but we do allow people to switch to German. So I have German selected here, and you just get a quick overview of what's happening. What are the topics being discussed? So over the last 30 days, unsurprisingly, the Taliban Kabul issues related to Afghanistan have taken over. Uh, but you also see here which accounts are the most influential on Twitter. And throughout the dashboard, we allow you to, to zoom in to anything that's of interest. So if you're looking at RT Deutsch, you could click on RT Deutsch and see all of their most recent content. You can also change the date ranges. So you can go back uh, to the past six months and see over time what are the topics that keep coming up. So one other quick feature of the dashboard I wanted to highlight before we get into some of our findings, we do have a new search tool. So if you came to the dashboard with a particular interest around a topic, you could run a targeted search. So given the topic of this discussion, election fraud, you see there hasn't been a ton of content that has specifically discussed election fraud in the context of the German election. However, when it has been discussed, it has mainly been discussed by the Russians. So RT Deutsch is the most active in discussing election fraud narratives, and you can scroll through and see the kind of content uh, that they are promoting. But again, you can run any search term of interest. So that's just a very, very brief overview of what the dashboard is. And now I'm going to go into some of the findings. So Christine is really going to handle the key narratives and themes. But of course, the number one question is, does any of this matter when we talk about foreign actors and their influence on the German audience, the German electorate? So with the understanding that engagement metrics, uh, followers, they're, they're imperfect uh, metrics in trying to determine uh, influence. What we have seen looking back over the past six months is that RT Deutsch clearly exists in a category by itself. So RT Deutsch has more than three times the number of retweets as the second most retweeted state media account, which is TRT Deutsch. And then everyone else exists sort of way far behind. Chinese state media outlets, not particularly influential on Twitter. And uh, there's probably been a lot of conversation in Germany uh, looking globally at the influence of China's wolf warrior diplomats, China's diplomats in Germany, uh, not particularly wolf warrior, for lack of a better term. Uh, they're pretty subdued, pretty diplomatic. So it's not particularly surprising, uh, you know, given monitoring of the influence of state media outlets globally, that Russian state media is at the top. This is consistent across the board. We expected RT Deutsch to outperform the other state media outlets in the German language. What was surprising looking at the last six months is how it is vis-a-vis -vis other German language media outlets, domestic media outlets. So as Suda mentioned uh, of the accounts that we're monitoring, they're the third most retweeted account of all German media accounts on Twitter. We don't have Der Spiegel here. Der Spiegel would probably perform a little bit better, but let's say they're top five. So RT Deutsch, very influential on Twitter. RT does quite well across the board on Twitter. But what was most shocking to us is when we looked at CrowdTangle at the German language media pages, RT Deutsch over the past year has had more interactions than any other German media outlet. So this was obviously unexpected. Um, we certainly didn't think they would outperform Build, for example. And when you look at the other related metrics there, so interaction rate, they're getting more interactions. So that's comments per post. Uh, views on own videos, they're third overall. And then when you look at the growth of their page, the page has grown 18% over the last year. The only outlet that has seen more growth, somewhat coincidentally or ironically, is TRT Deutsch but they have definitely seen more growth than the German language media outlets, the domestic German language media outlets. On YouTube, RT always does well, but RT Deutsch is doing particularly well. Again, looking at views, their top views over the last six months, uh, some of their videos are getting over a million views. That's obviously very significant in a country of 80 million. Uh, but typically when we're looking at the most, uh, the most viewed videos over the last six months, over the last year, consistently they're racking up more than a half million views. And as I scroll through here, one of the things you may notice uh, looking at the headlines, almost all of the content that is getting uh, significant traction uh, is about COVID, COVID restrictions, particularly vaccines. So public health skepticism is just the key theme throughout across all the different social media platforms. When you look at RT Deutsch, that's where they found an audience. Uh, it's just pretty clear. 
And when you look again back to crowd tangle data, when we dig into the groups that are sharing RT Deutsch's content, it tends to be groups that have an anti-government bent uh, or specifically are against COVID related restrictions or have sort of vaccine skepticism as their sort of core narrative or the reason for existing. One final point before I kick it over to Christine to talk about some of the specific narratives and topics uh, that we've seen promoted by all of the state actors we look at. Looking again back to RT Deutsch, again, just because they are the most significant. When you look at the numbers on YouTube, again, it's interesting. It's a Russian state media outlet. The fact they're talking about Germany more than any other country, not surprising, it's targeting German audiences. The US is two, Russia is sort of a distant three. Only about six and a half percent of their content that they put out on YouTube in German language actually talks about Russia. This is actually a little bit higher than we, when we look globally at what RT discusses. Usually it's about 4%. So most of the content put out by RT Deutsch isn't actually about Russia, with a few very notable exceptions, which again, Christine will discuss. So that's just an overview of the audience, the reach, uh, the engagement that we've seen uh, from the accounts we're monitoring. And I will now kick it back over to Christine. Thank you, Brett. On our German elections dashboard page, you can also find a link to our analysis. So some of the things I'll talk about quickly uh, before we go into our breakout sessions, you can read about in more detail on the dashboard site and on the analysis site. But the main trend that we saw that we're most concerned about is this very large influence that uh, RT Deutsch has in the Russian state media outlets, in particular on coronavirus uh, topics. So as Brett was saying, that there's a, they are a major driver of coronavirus opposition related content in Germany, and we see a lot of engagement with it. They are also a, a driver of Kremlin uh, and you know, Russian foreign policy views in the uh, German media space. So we have seen a very significant amount of coverage of Nord Stream 2, Black Sea, uh, Ukraine related conflicts, uh, and the messaging also on Kabul and on Afghanistan and the current situation there is also very skeptical about uh, the alliance, the value of Western military partnership and these questions, right? So these are um, you know, Russian foreign policy views that are having a large audience and large play in the German language on their sites. The Chinese messaging that we have seen has been related to China. It has until late, late this summer been largely focused on Xinjiang and on countering the narratives that would allege genocide in Xinjiang. And we uh, have seen a shift though very recently in the last about month and a half to address questions of COVID origin more directly and to attack uh, and propose uh, conspiracy theories about uh, origin potentially coming from the United States uh, also through that account. But in general, it is much less wolf warrior-y as Brett was saying than we have seen in other countries and in other places. Turkey and Iran um, are uh, less uh, politicized in many ways. Turkey has a puts a lot of attention on the on the treatment of Muslim populations across Europe. This is different from other mainstream or traditional outlets. And Iran is concerned uh, primarily with issues related to Iran, the JCPOA uh, having vaccine access for Iran and really does not seem to affect much of the typical foreign policy or domestic policy conversation in Germany. Um, we have a couple of questions that I'm going to give to pass over to Brett uh, that were coming in, and we're going to turn over to breakout groups very shortly. Brett, do you know what's the level of automated account retweeting, and have we run bot detection for uh, the particular accounts? We don't do bot detection, at least in aggregate, and at least sort of my cursory view of it, there doesn't seem to be a significant amount of inauthentic activity there. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It always exists to some degree, but there is no indicator we've seen that suggests that there huge sort of uh, engagement numbers are uh, artificial. Again, a small percentage may be, but I've seen nothing that suggests it is entirely uh, manipulated or inflated. We have another question here that comes uh, about whether it's any significant data on Chinese engagement to the German election campaign. Uh, I can take this. When we look at the, the tweet in particular uh, space, we see that it isn't necessarily German election campaign related. Some of these issues could come up in German foreign policy debates, for example, Xinjiang uh, can, but it isn't engaging uh, with candidates. When we look at RT Deutsch, for example, you do have engagement in particular candidates. And as Suda was saying, 
in our analysis, there is disproportionate coverage of an Elena Baerbock um, and a, you know, a, a spike also in coverage around scandals related to her. And uh, Laschet and Schultz received significantly less attention. And something we found very interesting in July was that uh, even though Laschet had scandals of his own, in particular related to the flooding uh, and his behavior during the floods, this was not uh, reflected in an especially high rate of coverage by the Russian state media. So it seems as though Annalena Baerbock is receiving more attention during her scandals than others do during their scandals by the Russian press. We have a further question. Um, so is the data in the dashboard collected in the public sphere or are you getting some additional support from the platforms to build this? No, we, we have no support from the platforms other than the fact that we get, because we're a research institution, free CrowdTangle access, but we have no access that most journalists or other academic institutions would have. Uh, and we don't have any sort of particular enterprise access to Twitter. So we're using their free public API. So while they have been somewhat helpful in, in just kind of helping set some of these things up, we get no access to data that the public could not access on their own. Thank you very much. So if you have more questions, this is really just a brief look at our analysis and at the tool itself, please feel free to go look at it in German and English. Run the searches that you're interested in. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We do have a team working on the dashboards uh, frequently and we can uh, help you run your searches or get the information out uh, if there is a question that you may have. But we are out of time for the dashboard presentation and the questions for that. And we will go on to the next part of our session. Here, we're going to have three breakout groups uh, and you will be able to choose and click on a breakout group on your screen. And we will be going into greater detail on three issues. One is Russian influence. Uh, the second one is Chinese influence. And the third is uh, gendered. Uh, gender disinformation. And this will allow us to go under Chatham House, so in a much more closed uh, setting to, into issues that we are concerned about uh, and how to address them potentially. We will have a readout at the end of each group, Chatham House, so nothing will be attributed, uh, but about our views on what the major problems are and what we could potentially do about them. So with that, uh, please choose your breakout groups and we will see you in these smaller sessions. We will come back after that for uh, the readouts from them, as well as our final big discussion, uh, which will be looking at what in general can we do to prevent uh, influence and interference in our elections processes and how do we strengthen democratic resilience across the transatlantic space. And that will be a conversation between uh, our director, Laura Thornton, and Daniela Schwartzer of the Open Society Foundation. Welcome back from the breakout sessions. I'm Christine Verling, a senior fellow at the Alliance for Screening Democracy. Uh, and welcome to this session to look at what the different breakout groups said about the threats posed by China, Russia, and um, looking at gender uh, disinformation as well in the election context in particular. I will now go to three rapporteurs uh, who will report out of the sessions. The first one is on Russia. Ellen, can you please tell us uh, how it went? Absolutely. Thank you, Christine. Um, so first, in terms of threats, the group discussed the fact that information manipulation is a better catch-all term for Russian interference and influence, rather than the more narrowly defined disinformation. And within that, one of the top lines was the idea of hack and leaks, which were discussed as a major area of concern with any state actor, including Russia. Um, the last few weeks before an election are especially vulnerable, but the group discussed the fact that the weeks after an election are also particularly susceptible. Using information to undermine trust in results is a tactic that participants had seen elsewhere, including in the United States, and it's not out of the question in Germany. Um, the group also discussed the fact that other elections, like the U.S. elections, have shown the willingness of electorates to consume information that is likely um, originated from Russia, and that there is a similar appetite potentially in Germany as well. 
Then in terms of threats, um, we also spoke about the fact that so much of the online activity is not inauthentic activity, not um, bot farms as we saw before, and this makes it particularly more difficult uh, to counter. And looking a little bit ahead, the group discussed potential for exploitation of the issue of Afghan refugees in Germany. Um, the group seems to be on the lookout for a convergence of anti-vax, anti-refugee, and electic skept election skeptic um, sentiments, which can um, certainly fuel the fire of um, information manipulation. And in terms of what can be done about it, um, so the group talked about um, two um, categories of solutions long-term solutions, which are a little clearer and include education and media literacy. Partic participants discuss the fact that um, these are 20 to 30 year objectives and should not target just children, but also older adults. In terms of short-term solutions, particularly for the election around the corner, um, the group discussed the fact that this is much more difficult and that there is a range of options, but that many have um, negative externalities. So for example, if Germany were to go in favor of shutting down RT Deutsch, which uh, the group did not seem to be in favor of, these could also lead to Deutsche Welle being censored in Russia. Um, so not a, a, not a wonderful pathway. Um, but immediately, it seemed that participants were in favor of raising awareness about the issue and particularly about the sources of information manipulation and not just the, co the common narratives. And that is all from our group. Thank you very much to Erlen. Uh, and over to Etienne to report out from the China group. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I think the first thing that came out of the group's discussion concerning what are the major threats um, concern the fact that uh, in Europe, China's goal has mainly been to burnish its image, uh, mainly reacting strongly to subjects like Xinjiang or the COVID origin investigations that kind of directly uh, involved the Chinese state and where China had to defend itself. Um, and where so the CCP defended itself and countered accusations that were leveled against it. Uh, there was no Russian style campaign to sow chaos uh, from the Chinese state. Um, and so they didn't really try to divide German or European audiences on issues that were important to local audiences, such as immigration or uh, anti-vax in the way that uh, the Russians have. Uh, this was possibly uh, in part because China doesn't necessarily have the sharp understanding of local um, German or European contexts, like it does in other places like Taiwan or Hong Kong, where it has been a lot more aggressive. Um, there was a conversation in the group in particular about what's happening in Australia, where China, China has tried to win over the Chinese diaspora there has given monetary incentives to pro-Chinese politicians and encouraged Chinese voters in Australia to sanction Australian politicians who go against Chinese interests. Um, in Germany, there is no significant Chinese diaspora. So the Chinese authorities have mainly focused on elite capture, on developing ties with uh, business communities, with politicians, uh, in some cases, having some former German politicians on China's payroll. Um, you've had a few uh, spying cases in Germany as well, with uh, German intelligence reporting that China uses the Chinese diaspora to put pressure on critics of Chinese uh, policies in Germany. Uh, as the EU kind of builds up its systemic rivalry uh, pillar with it in its relationship with China, there was uh, a real chance that Chinese tactics evolve in the future and maybe more in the direction of what is happening in Australia and become a bit more aggressive. Um, in terms of what can be done about Chinese interference in Germany, um, we had quite concrete steps. So like the first one was to reinforce uh, our political, the German political system uh, in anticipation of this kind of increase in aggression from uh, China. So for instance, by reforming the rules in the Bundestag about who can be hired as an aide to help the people there. Uh, another um, avenue that was explored for possible um, reform was the educational system, which is difficult given that Germany has a federal system where education is very much a competence of the states. 
nevertheless, there was uh, a push to maybe increase the awareness uh, at the state level of the risks that come with things like academic exchanges or cooperation with Confucius Institutes, which while for instance, academic exchanges are very important and should absolutely be maintained. Uh, there's also a need for like the federal states, the federal level to maybe have a bit more uh, visibility into what's happening at the local land level. And that's all from the China group. Thank you very much. And over to Ronya for the gender discussion. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we talked about what gender disinformation is, and, and we called it the spread of deceptive or inaccurate information about female political and public figures that distorts their public image. And that could be sex allegations, smear campaigns, the exploitation of sexist stereotypes, and just more negative um, coverage than other male competitors, for example. And um, the danger is that this not only takes away the power of the candidates to shape their own public image, but it is also a threat to an open political discourse, diversity and democracy itself. And um, the way that this happens in Germany, especially with gender disinformation, is that it often um, starts on Telegram channels and then moves onto Facebook. And um, in regard to the current um, election, we can see that Baerbock is targeted um, disproportionately more than other chancellor candidates. She is portrayed as a danger to Germany. Her competency is questioned. There are sexist insults. And we see a lot of gender language of her being portrayed as cute or lash or just not up to the job. Um, what is interesting is that not all women are targeted equally. Um, as you can imagine, um, women that are, in addition, a member of, a, of an ethnic minority um, are even more vulnerable to disinformation attacks. And interestingly, in Germany, we can see that, for example, Alice Weidel, who is um, um, one of the heads of the AFD party, and she is also mentioned very broadly in the public discourse in the internet, but she is actually portrayed rather positively um, in contrast to Baerbock. Um, we also took a look um, beyond Germany um, at author, uh, authoritarian states where we can see that um, authoritarian leaders actually um, use um, gender disinformation to sort of or as one category within their pecking order and um, by splitting society in groups of which gender is one, they um, make it easier, they make their own governing process easier because they can sort of set up these, group, these groups against each other. And um, it's also a national security issue. For example, um, there is um, disinformation around gender that is used by Russia to sow distrust about Western values and, for example, push Eastern European countries further away from NATO. And then lastly, on the tools and context or the tools and responses, we didn't really get to talk about that a lot because everybody was so keen on sharing their own analysis. But we um, concluded that there was inadequate um, protection in Germany against gender disinformation at this point, and that um, it's good to have monitor monitoring, um, which has been developed, but it's not uh, it's not good enough, and, and there needs to be done a lot. Thank you very much. I think we've had very good conversations over these three different topics. Uh, and now it's time to turn over to the final session of our event. Uh, this is going to be a conversation on a critical junction for, juncture for democracy. How do we move on from here? We have some ideas already from these breakout sessions, but let's go further into this conversation. I'd like to turn you back over to Laura Thornton, ASD director for this final session. Hi everyone. Um, I am delighted to have with me uh, a uh, to have a conversation with Daniela Schwartzer, the Open Society Foundation's Executive Director for Europe and Eurasia. She also happens to be a former uh, GMF leader as well. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm very glad to be with you. Um, you know, we've had a very interesting morning, afternoon, uh, discussing the German elections, and um, we heard a lot from speakers today that Russia in particular has played an outsized role in shaping some opinions and conversations in Germany. Uh, most notably, we got a presentation that showed that RT Deutsch 
has a large following on social media platforms that actually is outperforming uh, German news outlets. And I was wondering, you know, how do you see Russia's media influence affecting the political climate in Germany from society to the political elite? I guess Russia has had some success over the past years, really, to build the ability to influence domestic debates and mostly by amplifying domestic <clears throat> disagreements. And right now, the focus clearly is on Germany because of the upcoming elections. But those are developments you can also trace in other, in other EU countries. And um, what we, I think, can safely say is that uh, those who coming from Russia, who want to influence debates in such a way, they make ample use of the regulatory gaps we have and really use digital platforms to, to, to really achieve those goals. We've also seen um, really important incidents of Russian disinformation in Germany over the years. Um, and now, of course, attempts are being made ahead of the election to do more of that. Um, and, uh, you know, if you just, uh, maybe some of us will remember, us Germans in, in this uh, seminar, um, how Russian media tried to uh, attack uh, the German military presence on the eastern flank of NATO by, by spreading disinformation uh, on, uh, on German soldiers misbehaving and so on and so on. So, of course, you know, those stories are out and they, they suddenly... Uh, you know, they, they are not immediately um, contradicted because you have to make sure, you know, you know what's going on. And that leaves traces. And I think many of us remember those incidences. Um, I think the topic right now, which we could cite as an example, is the way uh, the COVID vaccine debate mm -hmm. has been influenced over the past year and a half. Um, where strange alliances build up in the social media sphere in particular of those who are against vaccines in general um, and you know, very, very German groups and, and, and uh, networks. Um, and then those who really try to use this topic to delegitimize the government. And I think this is really the major purpose of all of this. On the one hand, as I said, polarization within society uh, to be enhanced, um, but then also to delegitimize institutions, uh, be it in the COVID-19 crisis, the government, in particular the health minister um, and regional prime ministers who had to handle the crisis on the ground. Um, and in other cases, institutions like the German Bundeswehr. So um, this is, I think, the impact that we have to deal with. And as long as we do not um, handle this with a very sound regulatory approach, which makes it more difficult and, and some point, at some point, hopefully impossible, uh, for, for Russian intervention to have those effects. I think we will continue to tackle individual cases and not have this very broad approach that we should have. Just one final point, because you asked about the impact, um, not only of, 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 of singular incidences. I think the, the most worrying thing is that the techniques um, are being copied. Um, and this is not only Russian techniques, um, also, you know, the US campaigning under Donald Trump was closely watched. And I think we can now safely say, in particular on the far right, we have parties or actors, um, organizations that very, you know, clearly study what is happening and how these techniques are being used to polarize, to spread disinformation and to gain traction in social media. And so I think the effect after all, is quite lasting. You know, that's, you raised a lot of good points there. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, just as we come together as Democrats to talk about strategy and, and solutions and, and, and also diagnose problems, you know, that's happening on, on sort of the anti-democratic side as well uh, and, and sharing lessons learned um, from far-right campaigns in one place to another or illiberal anti-democratic campaigns. Um, you know, and you raised a really interesting point about, you know, COVID, for example, which certainly is happening in the United States as well. Uh, the manipulation, taking a foreign actor, manipulating a domestic wedge issue. Um, you know, how do you think the foreign information operations in Germany are bolstering those internal divisions in society? And like you said, a lot of it is also just to sow distrust in institutions of governance. 
Um, you know, do you think this will have a, a, a sort of a lasting impact or sort of beyond just the camp campaign period? Is this here to stay? I do think it is. And um, I think the key thing that you just pointed out uh, is the link between external and internal here. And while we see how easy it is for external actors by, you know, hybrid warfare and in particular disinformation, um, deep fakes, whatever they, they bring up to intervene directly in domestic political debates, we see very clearly how domestic actors try to pick up, as I said, the techniques of doing this, but in part also the messages. Um, and if you look at uh, what is happening in the far right sphere in Germany at the moment, um, this I think precisely proves your point um, that actors are in a way spreading the same kind of disinformation. Take for instance, uh, the vaccine example, which you quoted um, crazy stories about, about uh, the damage that vaccines brings, which are really beyond any uh, thorough scientific study that those are also out there. And of course there are risks and that shouldn't be uh, pushed away, but this deep exaggeration and, and the spreading of, of fear, um, that is something that, that leaves, you know, leaves its marks. And if you look at uh, even um, party politics and the way the Alternative für Deutschland, which is Germany's um, far right party, which has now been in the German parliament for a first sort of full four year period on the national level, they have more, have had more presence on regional levels before, but what, they, what their agenda is in part is really an undermining of credibility of in political institutions, of political leaders of other parties, and also a real strategy to, to block institutional functioning on all, you know, in all kinds of spheres where, where, they, uh, where they get an institutional presence. And so this um, tactic, uh, which is really part of, of, of their strategy, and you know, there's ample evidence that this is the way they have used their parliamentary presence for the past four years. If that goes hand in hand with, um, with um, disinformation and the public sphere that feeds the same, you know, mm -hmm. the same kind of story, um, then I think we have, we have a real problem because um, as we have seen in, in, in a number of crises that Europe and in particular Germany had to go through over the past decade, uh, starting from the sovereign debt and banking crisis that was a result of the financial crisis as of 2010, um, and now, you know, going to the COVID crisis, when there is a deep crisis, um, it is always essential for leaders to, to retain their credibility and to make sure that the institutions of, of government uh, stay credible to the citizens, because in deep crisis situations, obviously, they can't deliver that easily. So citizens feel threatened um, and are seeking protection, which is very hard to provide, for instance, in times of a pandemic, as we have now uh, in the world. And, and those are the windows of opportunity for those who wish to destabilize, who wish to really spread fear and wish to um, undermine the credibility of democratically elected leaders. No, I think we've seen the trust issue really come home to roost in a period of a crisis, uh, because it's when you need it, as you said, the most. If, if we don't have the faith in our government and institutions to tell us what we can do to keep ourselves safe, or there's so much disbelief about that, then, then we're at, at greater risk. And as we saw in the US, that it, it affects its trust in institutions, but also processes. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we have a large percentage of the population that now distrust the actual elections as being something to deliver a legitimate outcome and and that can have you know devastating effects for our democracy um but another issue that i think is sort of a million dollar question um is that what we're what we're dealing with now is yes obviously there's a supply side to this problem and and there's malign actors trying to sow distrust or undermine democracy but you know a big problem we face on this side of the atlantic is the demand side where the public is actually seeking out conspiracies or false narratives and is actually supporting um, 
authoritarian wannabes and anti-democratic <laughs> actors and movements. And, you know, something that we struggle with is, is you know, you know, it's one thing to sort of look at the channels of, of such anti-democratic forces. It's another thing to deal with the public and how do we address, you know, the ills that have driven these people into the arms of, of, of anti-democratic forces and how do we re-engage them uh, to liberal democratic values? Well, we have just spoken about crisis times and a pandemic is probably the worst crisis to have for, for those developments really to, uh, to find fertile grounds. Why? Because individuals are directly threatened um, in their health. So very, very personal perception of, of threat. And um, their, their daily life, their social contacts, everything is suddenly limited and they feel locked out. Um, some are obviously in isolation or have been in isolation for month and month. And in that setup, um, I think it is, it is understandable that suddenly people are, at least some, um, and we can see that in that it is a rising number, is open to easy stories, what is happening, and conspiracy theory finds a quite fertile ground. So uh, all kinds of conspiracy theories around, out there around the health issue, some relate to the vaccine question, which we've just discussed, and there are others about, uh, you know, the industry benefiting greatly because of mass production and vaccine production and so on and so on. So I think, you know, this is clearly a situation where you have all the ingredients. If you are a malign actor and you want to mobilize peers and spread stories that have the purpose of mobilizing people against something, that is mostly the case. And in this case, against reasonable behavior that actually allows to contain the pandemic, like get vaccinated, wear masks and so on and so on. You know, they can easily, they can easily uh, satisfy this demand for an explanation and a an seemingly easy and convenient solution in a situation where people are not at ease with the isolation they have to go through and so on. And, and I think we have something here in Germany at the moment uh, over the past one and a half years, which is really quite unique that we see mobilization on the street. Um, a lot of conspiracy theory being spread through actual, uh, you know, um, speeches at demonstrations and so on and so on. And this is, you know, I would say this is quite new to that extent as we have seen it grow in the COVID-19 crisis. And, um, what needs to be watched is obviously if this is going to spread to other questions uh, or, or themes that have an equal importance to citizens in, in their daily lives. Well, absolutely. And I think um, so much of what you said too about the crisis that we're living in does make us, I think, more vulnerable. Uh, just being cut off from communities has us in some ways, I think, seek out different communities. I have often wondered if, if QAnon, for example, would have been quite as popular if people weren't sitting at home, isolated from their friends and family and looking to engage in some way. Um, so that is something that I think is, is really hard to identify and, and find solutions, solutions to. But um, we appreciate OSF's efforts to continually support that democratic resilience building uh, so that we can rebuild trust in facts and senses of democratic community and ensure that democratic institutions and processes deliver for people. So we appreciate all the work that you've done. And, and again, also thanks for your support for this particular project uh, on the German elections and appreciate our conversation so much. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for having me. And uh, this marks also the closing of this event. And I again want to thank everyone who uh, was, were panelists, participated in the breakout groups, and a special shout out to my colleagues at GMF Berlin and at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.